Dear Actabliz, this is Bob and I have grievances. I let myself try your alpha. I hopped into a warlock and I spent about 10 minutes with it and it sucks. The system is boring and all I have is this upside down netherlight crucible. I represent everyone when I say... Okay, that's kind of rude. Ooh, a launch date. Yay. Hey, it's Soul. It's April 6th, 2018. This is Warcraft Weekly. That is Bob right over there. Let's get started. So this turned out to be quite a week of excitement, of reveals, of news, and news, and more news. Apart from that, what about your folks' news? Share your Warcraft, your real life, your toilet adventures in a comment below. I always like reading those little stories. Obviously, the biggest news came in just yesterday with the reveal of the Battle for Azeroth launch date, and all the other stuff that came with it. But first, let's get to the things that happened just before yesterday. Sunday evening, the show Family Guy aired a special kind of internet meme episode where they featured all sorts of outdated jokes and things that we don't care about. Among them happened to be a special World of Warcraft reference. Did you see it? Oh yeah, it was really gripping and, and exciting. Yeah, with that one part where the that guy. you know the, the the Warcraft dude yeah. you know he was he was jumping around right, and right. yeah and then that one part you know the the thing where um you know the main character for Family Guy he oh that was funny yeah did a funny yeah, thing yeah. and <laughs> you know <laughs> it was um wait did you even watch it no did you no so I really got a hand to whoever had the idea of bringing back like these old awkward jokes to make not just us at the Warcraft community, but the community all over the internet to, to pull out this collective cringe at, ah, I ain't dissing on people who enjoy Family Guy. I know people, I don't talk to them anymore, that, you know, used to watch or that do watch Family Guy. Um, this week's featured YouTuber is Ursulus Gaming, finally. Ursulus has a voice that I am kind of jealous of. Well, it's smooth, it just kind of eases your way into the ear gently, pushing around the folds of... Never mind. Ursulus runs a very small channel, and the focus of that is kind of current events, but more so opinion sharing. And I'm a big fan of opinion sharing, especially the ones that we don't quite agree with all the time. Maybe I should call these unpopular opinions. Like Soul's opinion. Precisely. Just recently, he put out a video defending looking for raid. Very big balls. Now, I do think it's great when people want to share their very passionate opinions and feedback, um, and they draw upon their emotions on it because that's very personal to them. That's cool. It's when you take those emotions and you project that onto others and try to push your opinion that way, um, as if you're speaking for a large number of people, as in not you. That's where I take some issue, but... Let me lean away from that, get back to Ursulus. Like I said, Ursulus has a small channel, but I think he's the kind of person that is very approachable. I think he's easy to talk to. I traded just a small number of comments with him, and so far, all is still good, right? But I think his channel is worth a visit. Drop in, tell him I said hi, or maybe if you're in the comments, Ursulus, hi. As always, if you know of a WoW content creator or YouTuber, streamer that you think should get a little bit more attention, and they have 10,000 or fewer subscribers or some sort of equivalent, let me know in a comment below uh, who, you want to, who you want me to feature, and maybe I'll feature them in a future weekly. This week, like many weeks, introduced another Battle for Azeroth alpha build. There was, once again, quite a bit to reveal with cool looking mounts, other funny pictures, these things of old gods, I don't know what that stuff is. But one of the two big things included Voldun, the sixth and final zone of this starting Battle for Azeroth overworld stuff. You mean the zone? Yes, the, the zone. I admit that, at the moment, I don't have a strong first impressions of it, other than it looks cool, it has a very obviously desert kind of feel, but it does break into these kinds of rocky outcroppings and these other interesting little tidbits, along with, of course, troll ruins, lots of troll ruins, trolls themselves, and all those little Vulpiran fox goblin fuzzy people. 
The place feels cool, and I think so far it's a good round off for all the different kinds of zone environments that we're seeing in the battle for Azeroth so far. I've been really liking the look and feel of the different environments. They feel a lot more natural than past expansions. At least at the moment, we're not seeing any huge contrasts like the corruption over in Valshara or everything that is the Broken Shore and Argus. But so far, in terms of the overall world development and the spread of quests and the environments and just and like I said, the ambient and the look of things, I'm I'm really excited for, for the expansion so far. On the other side of things came the first iteration of Azerite Traits, the kind of bread and butter system that's going to make up progression in this expansion. I gave a pretty lengthy set of first impressions on this system. In fact, I needed two videos to do it. It pretty much took up all my production time for the weekend, or for the week. Whoops. But just to super, super summarize everything, and I'm going to talk about it just a little bit more when I start talking about everything, all the news that went on yesterday. I still have very high hopes for the system, but I really wish that Blizzard uh, gave us a first impression of the system by giving us uh, a bit more meaty of a sample. They gave us one piece of gear with one set of traits, and they're pretty much the same for everybody. So it leaves a bad first taste when it enters your mouth, if I wanted to use some analogy. I was hoping that they would deliver a slightly more unique piece of gear, or more importantly, a set of gear for us to play with. But after a little bit of discussion, maybe a little speculation, we can conclude that the kinds of traits that we're seeing so far mostly involves leveling, which makes all of this pretty much fine. It's not impressive, but considering the gear that you're sitting on, it's not something that we're going to be keeping for a long time either. At any rate, Blizzard did say that they were going to release more uh, as builds continue to come in, so I'm looking forward to testing out more. The Mobile Auction House, which is the application that lets you literally do auctions through your phone, is going away. Now don't panic everyone. Unless you're on the toilet, maybe it'll help a little bit. The API, or otherwise the thing that allows communication with certain external sites such as the Undermine Journal, Trade Skill Master, that sort of thing, those are not going to be affected, so... Whew. For me, I'm not going to be very affected by this. I don't really use the application, especially because I sell glyphs. Those are small ticket items that sell at, you know, reasonable prices. This was something that people really tried to stay on top of, especially if you were trying to sell or hunt for big ticket items. As to whether or not they're going to introduce something new, I have no idea. It's all up to speculation, but I'm just curious, are any of you affected at home? If you got feedback about this or anything that I'm going to be talking about today, feel free to leave a comment below. I'm always up for a cordial conversation and I really read a disturbing number of the comments, which is like all of them. Even mine? No. So there's something that I want to try to do, and I need your help. And thankfully, I have some extra gold on me. So here's what's going on. I want to try doing a Q&A, right? Just sit here, answer questions to the best of my ability, um, give opinions, uh, share, share a little bit of my story, that sort of thing. Um, so I would love if you folks at home and on the toilet can just send me your questions. Ask me stuff about the world of Warcraft, about the channel, the things that I do, semi, you know, surface scratching personal questions, actual questions, you know, actual questions, that helps too. And among them, I will choose two people and I will give them a WoW token. So that could be you. I think it's a cool way to, well, one, do another giveaway and two, uh, just give myself an excuse to talk and, and otherwise hang out. Um, because, because I do that kind of a lot already in my streams, but not everyone watches the streams, and that's totally okay. But I do uh, I do want to invite people to uh, sit down and at least share a conversation or something like that with me through a Q&A format as well. So go ahead, ask me a question in a comment below. No need for tweets or nothing like that. I'm going to read through everything, and I'll mark everything as, uh, as, as a possible question. And I'm going to, uh, in some future video, not during the weekly, it's probably going to be a separate thing depending on how many I get. Um, I'm just going to go through and just gun through all these questions, and hopefully it'll... it'll It'll be fun. So go, do it, right now. He's lonely. Yeah. So, on a day previous to Tuesday, I'm gonna I'm gonna guess Monday. Blizzard held a special media event with personalities from all over. They invited folks to come in and reveal some stuff, do some interviews, things like that. And you know, they brought a lot of you know cool people, and 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 not me. Oh. No, it's all good. Otherwise, you would have been left at home. You would have been so sad. Aww. So there was a crap ton of information. I talked about it for like literally two hours in a previous stream. Now if you want to put up with two hours of that stuff, 
hey, go ahead. But what I'm going to do today is go through the highlights, my favorite things that I think matter the most to players, maybe leave a couple of comments about it and move on to the next thing. So without further ado, Let's get to the news news. The Battle for Azeroth expansion is coming out August 14th, 2018, presumably at midnight on a Tuesday. Now's the time to put in that vacation time or accidentally get sick. And Blizzard, I'm sticking my neck out here. You can probably feel confident about taking this time off because thanks to the Legion launch, it leaves a very good impression on players, including myself, that thanks to sharding technology, as controversial as some of you folks might uh, believe it to be, that it's going to help foster a very smooth launch process, just like in Legion. It wasn't perfect, but in the face of any sort of Blizzard launch, in the face of DDoS attacks and the unintentional DDoS attack when there's tons and tons of players logging in all trying to click on the same thing. Sharding does serve a purpose. The physical collector's edition for the Battle for Azeroth expansion also came out. They had some pretty cool stuff to reveal, including a double-sided book. This double-sided book is going to include two kinds of stories, one from the Horde and one from the Alliance that are going to tell the tale right before the major events that kick off this expansion. The Alliance story is called Elegy by Christy Golden, who is one of the more recent additions to the Blizzard team, as well as the author of the Before the Storm book, which is coming on June 12th, which is my birthday, Christy. Did you tweet her yet? No, I'm kind of, I'm kind of shy. The Horde side of the story is called A Good War, written by Robert Brooks. If he doesn't sound as familiar, he's also a Blizzard writer and also happened to write the Tomb of Sargeras and the Thousand Years of War audio drama which are both awesome and free. You get a soundtrack, cool. You also get this thing called a Mark of Allegiance, and I have a picture up here, thankfully posted with banana and a quarter for scale. These things aren't meant to be too heavy, but I do have one question. Can I make a medallion out of it? You know, like, can I have something just dangling around here or something? That's so cheesy. Or I can have you dangling here. Come here. You know, dang around like a like a midget, like that ludicrous video. Ha <laughs> ha! The best part of this collector's edition is that if you are interested in buying it, and you already have a copy of the Battle for Azeroth, whether it is the uh, regular version or the digital deluxe, if you buy the physical copy, you will be credited appropriately for the difference that you had paid before. Now. Don't take my word for this. I don't know all the details and I don't want to screw things up and otherwise get in trouble because I told you the wrong thing. I'm going to have a link below with all the information that you need on that. So that way you can blame someone else and not me. But from the sounds of it, you can get a little bit of money back if you are interested in picking up that collector's edition. So cool. Save a little money. All right. What's next? The beta. The beta for Battle for Azeroth has not quite started yet. We're still on the alpha and the reason is because not all the systems are done, are quite done and ready to at least roll out for initial impressions yet. There are a couple of things that have yet to be tested. There's Warfronts that has yet to be tested, even though we've learned quite a bit of information and I'll let you know in just a little bit. Not all the dungeons have been tested, but I have a feeling that they'll probably proceed with beta, uh, even though all, not all the dungeons have been tested yet. And then there is the PvP mode or war mode, as they're calling it. That's going to include whatever gameplay enhancements that happens to come with war mode, as well as the revamped prestige system which again, I'll get into it in a little bit. There's also communities, the big social tool that I've been like waving my flag around as if I'm a freaking developer for it. At least with that, I'm kind of guessing that that's not going to be implemented until the beta when there's just a lot more people that can jump in, create their own communities, have people add and, you know, just having more people um, in the beta for testing communities is probably the better idea anyway. There's a chance, not a 100% chance, not a 0% chance that the beta will launch if one or if none of these modes are ready for actual testing yet. I think that some of the bigger components, such as having all the zones, having the Azerite gear and some of that stuff, I think that's more important to have before pushing this into beta when you have a considerably higher number of players participating and giving feedback or otherwise feedback that could have been useful if they had implemented more stuff before that. So keep an eye out. But in the meantime, they still have been doing more and more alpha invites. So I'd advise you to at least keep checking your clients, double check uh, the client and see if it, if it happens to say alpha on it, it means you're in. There's nothing else that you have to check. And if you can get in, cool. All right, lore. And these shouldn't be spoilers because I'm kind of giving non-information, but it's information at the same time. Gahoon, which is the worm-like 
nasty maggot looking thing that's influencing well okay i won't spoil that part but gahoon the big worm looking thing it's been rumored that it might be an old god that there might be another old god that wasn't mentioned by the chronicles and wasn't noticed by any of the titans or anybody that theory can now kind of walk back gahoon is more like an agent of the old gods a very powerful one at that there aren't that many other details but I'm not going to bother sharing them anyway, but at least for the moment that door is closed where there might be hidden old gods that were previously unknown. To me, that's really similar to having the Void Lord suddenly appear and being the new big bad of Warcraft and the thing that supersedes Sargeras, even though he wanted to destroy everything. Apparently, that's better than a return to nothingness. But that's okay. Gahoon is just a very... But that's okay. Gahoon... based on or behaving according to what is morally right and fair. What? But that's all okay. We just know that Gahoon is simply a very powerful thing that we have to fight at some point. When it comes to the burning of Tel Drazzle, or Tel Drassil as some people call it, the events that lead up to that are meant to be vague. In other words, Blizzard is going to do their best to troll us all the way up into the very end. And probably past that. There's been a ton of rumors going around that Sylvanas is evil, and it's no secret that she's very aggressive and mean and ruthless. Uh, but evil, that's still kind of up in the air, apparently. It's almost a non spoiler at this point that the Great Tree Teldrassil is going to burn, and now it's just a matter of who done it, who started it. But as to whether she ignited the tree somehow, or is directly or even indirectly involved with igniting the tree, we're not sure, which means that this debate can keep going on forever because Blizzard intends for it to. Now, knowing that, you might be tempted, ah, oh, screw that, that's no fun. It's just gonna be a whole, you know, a whole conflict that's going to escalate into this war. That's that's boring. Some people do, in fact, kind of find that boring and that's okay. I find it fascinating because it's going to make certain Horde and Alliance fan people just go at it and keep going at it. And to me, that is... <laughs> That is more of the celebration of Warcraft. No, you just like watching the chaos unfold. Yeah. Now for the last little bit of lore, we know that there's going to be a war campaign in the Battle for Azeroth where uh, the Horde and Alliance, they're going to be at first questing in their initial areas, but at the same time there's going to be these war campaign events that will draw them over to the other side for a little bit. It's not going to be until max level when you really open up the entire world of Kul Ras and Zandalar, and you start visiting there for violence and shenanigans. But the way that this campaign is going to play out is going to be similar to the Suramar story, with the exception of not having a Suramar-like zone to work with. It's going to be more or less everywhere. So in light of that, things that we won't expect, we won't expect this war campaign to be gated behind mission tables. So we're not entirely sure what the point of mission tables are going to be in this expansion. We think it's going, I think it's going to have something to do mostly with end game stuff and otherwise uh, being able to access like daily dungeon content or weekly raid content, that sort of thing that we're kind of used to in Legion. But otherwise, with regards to the campaign, you can count on a... Well, for lack of a better word, a time gate. With any luck, this campaign will be similar to the Suramar storyline as opposed to like the Broken Shore storyline. So we can expect a meteor and a steady flow of digestible content, as well as unlocks, rewards, cosmetics, that sort of thing. And I think that's cool. There will be new pets. Woo, whoop de doo On top of that, there are going to be new types of pet charms to suit this new season of pet gathering and fighting. Indirectly, that's also going to mean that if you happen to be farming pet charms in lieu of the next expansion, you can stop. Just spend them on whatever you can, because it's not going to work in Bitha. Alright, Warfronts. We finally got a little bit more information about the schedule and how it's going to operate. Uh, the unfortunate thing about the schedule is that we don't quite know when they're going to actually launch within the Battle for Azeroth window. It could be at launch, it could be part of the war campaign, which is what I presume. It could be later, which would be incredibly unfortunate. So here's how war fronts are going to work, and I'm going to use as few words as I can get away with. First, you gather resources, gold, Azerite, trade skill things. You turn that into somebody, you fill up a bar. In fact, your entire faction and the entire region that you're playing in is participating in this. It's very similar to the Broken Shore campaign, uh, you know, with those buildings on the Broken Shore, with the exception that this is just your faction. Once you fill up that bar for your team, ta-da, 
the Warfront becomes available. The Warfront will be available for one week, and as soon as you win it, you can enjoy the fruits of your labor. That means additional questing as well as a world boss, although we don't know where. We're going to presume that it's in Arathi Highlands, which is the location of the first Warfront anyway. But I could be wrong. Like always. Yeah. While holding the Warfront, the opposite faction is going to be mining for more resources, giving stuff away, donating it to the cause, filling up their own bar. Once the bar fills up for them, now they can participate in the Warfront, win it, and basically take it back from you. And the roles switch places where now you are gathering resources, building things up, trying to fill up that bar. The question that I have revolves around the fact that they're going to release multiple Warfronts during the course of the expansion. So I'm wondering, when Warfront number two opens up, what happens to Warfront number one? Are we now going to have to essentially feed two sets of Warfronts in order to access that sort of gameplay? I want to think no, that there's going to be some sort of system where once you move from Warfront 1 to Warfront number 2, number 1 is just going to go on its own kind of passive schedule where it's going to change hands and then the Horde or Alliance can participate it when it's their turn. As for turning the resources and that sort of thing, that's only going to apply to the most current Warfront. And then you just kind of go from there as they release more and more of them if there are in fact going to be more. So while we don't have any official hands-on gameplay and, and impressions yet, at least from the sounds of the schedule, I'm pretty happy with it. It doesn't sound like it's going to be like super impactful on gameplay. It's not going to take up too much time, which is something that I was very concerned about. All right, cosmetics. Not a lot to say on this one, except for that upright orcs are going to be available at the pre-patch for the Battle for Azeroth. So I find that very cool. And while it wasn't stated, I'm going to assume or presume that the golden eyes for Blood Elves are also going to be made available at that time. I think it's great that we don't have to wait for Maghar Orcs whenever that's going to come uh, to launch before we can access this new bit of customization. Funny enough, there was also the mention of upright undead people, to which Blizzard said, it's up to Sylvanas. What the fuck? You know, I'll be honest, folks, I really didn't think that upright undead we're just gonna be a thing right i did that video that up there i just did that video because hey you know what i can i can i can get that look going and who knows maybe that might be a thing someday ah i doubt it it might be wow that's that's different. Uh, for Island Expeditions, I guess I should have mentioned this earlier, um, but Island Expeditions are going to be something that unlocks during the war campaign at some point. I don't know if it's the end or the beginning or, or whatever. But the cool thing is that once you do have them unlocked, that unlock is considered a game-wide unlock thing for your whole account. So I think that's cool. There's already going to be just a little bit of alt-friendliness jabbed into the mix. It's just a matter of how useful um, expeditions are going to be during the leveling process. I mentioned allied races a little bit earlier, uh, but now we kind of have a relative or tentative schedule on how these things are going to unlock. So at the start, or chapter one of the Battle for Azeroth, where we're doing our zones and doing our war campaigns, by the end of our war campaign, we're going to have unlocked both the Maghar Orcs for the Horde side and the Dark Iron Dwarves for the Alliance side. Now I find this to be a very interesting, not exactly a bait and switch, but more like a twist of some sort, where later in the expansion, supposedly, we're going the Horde are going to get Zandalari trolls, while humans are going to get cool Tauron humans. And lore-wise, this makes sense to me, because at the very beginning of these expansions, you're not considered very friendly with these certain factions, and it would feel a little bit weird if you just did one sort of quest line with them, or you know, one zone-wide quest line, and then all of a sudden, hey, yeah, we want to join the Horde or Alliance or whoever, sure. These two peoples, these Kulturan humans and these Zandalari trolls, they have, they got their own shit to deal with, and we're going to be spending a lot of time trying to help them out, and otherwise trying to forward our own faction's agenda. I know that some people are not going to be happy about it, some people who expected to be able to play Zandalari trolls like day one or day two of the expansion, now don't quite have something like that to look forward to, and that is a real bummer. So if you're mad, let us know in the comments, and well, to be honest, I'm, like I said, I'm pretty convinced that this makes sense to me, but if you if you want to make your case and talk with me about it, and talk with me about it, about why you think these Zandalari trolls or cruel torn humans should be available much earlier than that, I'd love to hear it. The last thing that they alluded to is that future allied races, such as the Maghar and the Dark Iron Dwarves, they're not going to be unlocked the same way that the first four allied races were unlocked, where you had to wrap up, get them to Exalted, then do a questline, and then you get them. 
apparently for the Maghar and the Quiltron, uh, for the, I'm sorry, the Maghar and the Dark Iron Dwarves, once you complete the campaign, something in the narrative is, is going to get these already established old races to join the cause. All right, so PvP, the long forgotten thing of Legion. I know I'm being mean. So Blizzard reiterated the perks of leveling while you're in PvP mode or war mode, as they're calling it. To clarify, in order to enter war mode, you have to be in your respective main capital. So that means either Stormwind or Ogrimmar, and then you can flag yourself for PvP. And I do find it curious that in this picture that there's only four talent choices available for PvP. Hmm. Here's the cool thing that I'm sure some people are going to be excited about though. Prestige, the thing where you're earning honor endlessly for cosmetic rewards, is going to be considered account-wide. We don't have concrete details on exactly how that's going to work, like for example, if you have multiple tunes that have multiple prestiges and a ton of honor among them, is that all going to be pulled into one thing, or is it just going to be whoever has the highest amount of prestige, that's what you get, and then moving forward, uh, all other honor is going to be shared. We don't quite know that yet, or at least I missed it. And if I did, I'd love for you to correct me. But I think that's awesome. That's something that a lot of people have been asking that feel really helpless when it comes to, hey, I want to be able to get acknowledged for, oh, you know, whatever this PvP stuff that I'm doing. And Blizzard has always been pushing back, pushing back uh, throughout the entire expansion. And thankfully, they've relented. So well done. Bitching sometimes does, in fact, pay off. The other cool thing is that conquest points are going to make a return. Gone are the days of going to your obliterum forge and recycling some of that gear for one measly token uh, in an effort to try to get the gear that you want. I admit this isn't a lot of information, but here's how it's going to work instead. You go do PvP stuff. You go do the things that earn you conquest points, which we don't know what they are yet. Once you earn enough conquest points to fill up a bar, you get a piece of gear. So as far as we know, we turn this in and we either get a random piece of gear or we're just granted a piece of gear that we don't already have or we get to choose gear from a vendor. We're not quite sure how that works out. What we do know is that once you complete a PvP set, from there, grinding for more honor or conquest, I'm sorry, and you fill out the bar and you get another piece of gear, that's going to be upgraded. So now you can upgrade to the next level of gear. Conquest is not the only way or probably not the fastest way to get PvP gear. There are other, even faster routes in order to get this gear, apparently. For those who are gladiator-minded and probably RBG-minded, they are still going to grant gear from random strong boxes. Again, I'm not entirely sure how that's going to work by having this sort of hybrid system of predictable um, you know predictable rewards based on your activity versus a random strong box that we're kind of used to and this gear that you get as a gladiator minded player is supposed to be equivalent to raid gear I don't know if it's LFR or normal or heroic or mythic but they did say raid gear. The last thing on PvP is the PvP mode itself. We know that there's going to be like XP and Azrite enhancements but I just want to pose a question that someone had posted on MMO Champion just or just a little while ago. In light of the fact that we're going to be doing most of our leveling in our home zone, so to speak, this kind of gives a unfair advantage for players who play the first, you know, day one, day zero of the expansion. Because here's what here's what you can do: either when the expansion launches or right before, switch yourself to PvP mode or war mode. Because while you're in war mode, you're only sharded with people that also are in war mode. And on top of that, when you do your leveling, you're in your home faction. You're not really PvPing with anybody because everyone else is leveling on their other, uh, on their side of the planet. So it seems that at the moment, if you're going to be leveling at the start of the expansion, just turn on PvP mode and level as fast as you can because there's no alliance that's going to get in your way and hopefully there won't be a lot of people that get in your way either. And on top of that, you get whatever XP and Azerite bonuses because apparently that's supposed to make up for whatever lost time you have from getting your ass beat by the other faction. They're just not there. So, you know, enjoy this while you can and, you know, thankfully I'm a small channel. No one's going to see this. So just shh. All right, we're coming close to the end. Uh, let's talk about loot and and gear and stuff 
So this media event happened right before this current alpha build came out. So we, including me, had all these little impressions and reactions to it, knowing that there were these statements. You know, meanwhile, a lot of people in the media community were sitting on this other information that doesn't reveal too much, but it just kind of sheds a little bit of light on the situation with Azerite traits. So apparently, the people with cooler heads prevailed. It turns out that, at least from the quotes that we're looking at, the kinds of Azerite traits that we're seeing are considered to be, like I said earlier, leveling traits. It seemed pretty obvious because we're getting heal on kills and stuff like that, and that kind of stuff isn't very useful for for raiding or mythic plus even unless it's like a ne not a necrotic but that just depends on the effects and even then maybe i'm very heavily paraphrasing here but one of the quotes from blizzard uh said something along the lines of well if you're doing a very a very simple quest and this very simple quest awards you a piece of azurite gear you can probably expect that kind of azurite gear to be very simple because really that's all you did and if that's the case I'm totally fine with it. Because that kind of brings to mind the kinds of Azerite gear that might be appearing. And they did speak a little bit about this uh, during this MIDI event as well. For example, questing gear can kind of have similar properties to the leveling gear uh, traits that we're seeing in this current build. Where you see very simple stuff, ways to heal yourself, one little thing to supplement your current spec, a little bit of extra item level, and so on and so forth. Meanwhile, other game modes can provide gear with Azerite traits that are somewhat unique to themselves, but at the same time, there's the whole synergy meta to deal with. Ideally, I would hope that in order to get like the super best in slot thing for whatever high-end PvE content that you're doing, you probably want to dabble in a little bit of Warfronts, a little bit in dungeons, a little bit in raids in order to perfect that certain set. Same will go for PvP, how you can maybe get a certain Azerite set by I don't know, repping up with a certain faction, or otherwise obtaining it from filling up that whole PvP conquest bar, or getting it from a strong box, or completing a PvP based island expedition, maybe. And last, but probably least, personal loot. Someone during this media event asked a question on whether or not personal loot is still going to be a mainstay forced thing in the Battle for Azeroth like it was talked about in the most previous Q&A with Ian Azekosis and Josh Allen. The answer that was given was, they don't know. They really just don't know because that's not something that is of their expertise. The only bit of feedback that I have on that Blizzard is this. Please, oh please, don't take away choice. There's only so much that I want the game to do for me. This is a focused, a pinpoint problem, I guess, and it should have that kind of focused solution. Not one that's going to affect everybody. And that, I think, finishes up this roundup, huh? I want to thank you all for listening and watching and making it to the end. I rely on the support of you, that's right, you, to help keep this channel going. Whether it's with a like, a kind comment, your participation in contests, or even being a patron. If you enjoy this content and the things that I do, and you want more, please support me the best way you know how. That way I too can go to one of these special Blizzard media events, you know, rub elbows with some of these personalities and be like, hey, hey, so, uh... What's your favorite uh, flavor of pie, hmm? Because I love doing what I'm doing, and I don't want to stop. Anyway, tune in next week for more streams, shenanigans, video essays, whatever the heck that I'm doing. And Bob. Especially B. Mm. Anyway, thanks again for letting me be a short part of your day, and I'll see you the next thing that I do. Until then, stay safe, stay happy, and stay breezy.